Hey guys, Matt here getting back into James. Last time we talked about James 1.1 and how important it is. We must see the language James uses, the language Peter uses in 1 Peter. Uh, it, how important that is regarding the entire church. He talks about the 12 tribes in the dispersion. He uses formerly Jewish language to speak of the entire church, Jew and Gentile alike. Watch that video if you missed it. It's, it's really important that you get that. If you miss that, you'll miss the thrust of First and Second Peter and James. Uh, we get into verse 2 today. We're going to look at verses 2, 3, and 4. Verses that you've probably read before about suffering. I just want to take a quick look at this because suffering is a major theme in the New Testament. And it's not always taught, uh, especially in some of the bigger churches, some of the name it and claim it kind of churches, the word of faith, they miss out on this. And they miss out on the, the glory of being sanctified and suffering with Christ. And it's a good thing. That's why James writes about it. He says this, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces something. What does it produce? Well, it produces steadfastness. Well, that's great. What does that produce? And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, you'll notice something here. James, first of all, turns the world upside down and he says, count it all joy. Not just a little joy. Count it all joy when you suffer trials of various kinds. And there's a reason for it. There's a reason God allows us to go through trials. There is a reason, and it's a very good reason. It's because of the progression that happens through the trial. Let's read it again, and then we'll talk about this. He says, Count it all joy, all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Now, this is interesting here, because he's going to give us a hint here. First of all, count it joy, and there's a reason. We'll get to that in a minute. Count it joy when you meet trials of various kinds. What do you do with that? Various kinds. I think what he's doing is he's saying, be ready, identify them, because they're not all going to look the same. They're, for some it's going to be health. For some it's going to be relational. For some it's going to be financial. It could be anything. There's going to be various kinds of trials. You need to be ready for them. How do you be ready for them? By constantly reading the Word. How would you know to have joy in trials? How would you know to be looking out for various kinds of trials if you didn't read this passage, right? By the way, there's a ton of passages like this. We'll look at a couple more. So he says, count it all joy when you receive trials of various kinds. Be ready. Be alert. They're, they're, they're not all going to look the same. And here's the reason. For you know that the testing of your faith produces something. It produces something called steadfastness. Now, if you look up the word steadfastness, you'll, you'll see it's uh, the same thing as endurance. It teaches us endurance. Now, there's another word that, that you'll find, and I've never really thought about this word. I love this word. The word is constancy. Constancy. Rejoice in your trials of all kinds, in fact, count it all joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces constancy. Think about that. Don't you want constancy? Don't you want to be a 100% Christian? Don't you want to be a Christian seven days a week, 24-7, 365? Don't you want more faith? We all do. If you, if you are a true believer, if you love Jesus Christ, of course you do. But here's the thing. You don't get it. You don't get endurance. You don't get steadfastness. You don't get constancy by reading a book about it. Right? Think of the runner, the marathon runner. Think if he just sat on the couch and read books on running marathons. Well, this is how I train my heart. This is how I train my cardiovascular system. This is how I feed my body. All of those things. He just reads about it. And the night before the race, he crams really hard, and he runs the race, and he peters out right away. 
Why? Because that's not how you learn endurance. You learn it by going through it. This is why God uses trials. He tests our faith. He isn't testing us like he's, he's wondering what's going to happen. He's letting us be tested so that we see God is good. God is faithful. God's going to get me through this. And when I get through this, I'm going to have something called steadfastness. I'm going to have endurance. I'm going to be constant in my faith. I'm going to have consistency or constancy. And then that's going to produce something else. And the endurance, the constancy, the steadfastness produces something called perfection. Being complete, lacking nothing. Now, ultimately, this doesn't mean that we're going to be made perfect on this side of heaven. It means that we're serving a perfect God and He's using these tests to train us in endurance and steadfastness to bring us to perfection. Our faith is being perfected or matured, and when we meet Him, then we will be made like Him in every way. We will have glorified minds, glorified bodies. We will see things the way He sees things. Until then, we need to grow in our faith, and that only comes through trials. There's another thought on trials that I think is really, really big. Some people who don't know Christ might say, what kind of God would let his people suffer? What kind of God would do that? I want you to think of something. Turn this around a little bit. What if God were like Santa Claus and he gave you everything your little heart desired every time you asked? He was like a genie in a bottle. You just rub him and you get your wishes and you go about your way and you're really happy. Would it be easy for someone who doesn't know this God to look and say, well, of course they love Him. He gives them everything they want. But what about that same person looking at the Christian, watching the Christian suffer and say, I don't understand it, but they're suffering and they still love Him. In fact, they seem to love Him more. Their faith seems to be growing in the middle of suffering. They don't know what to do with that. It confuses them. It might even bring some of them to salvation. Others, it might further compound their wrath. But God's going to use it all, and God shows His goodness in letting His people suffer because it shows how much they love Him, even in the midst of suffering, and they do get the benefit of steadfastness. And that steadfastness leads them to being perfected, being matured, being complete, and lacking nothing. That is why God uses trials. And it is a very, very <clears throat> good thing. You'll notice something else about this. That you can't go from A to C without going through B. In other words, we can't go through the trials and just immediately end up on being perfect and complete, lacking nothing. It doesn't work that way. We don't go from A to C. We've got to go A, B to C. So we, we incur the trials, we go through the trials, we can consider it all joy because we know even though it's going to be a little painful in our flesh, we know that we're going to go through this season of constancy, of endurance, of steadfastness. It's going to grow our faith, it's going to teach us how to be overcomers, which is the major theme of Revelation, the big encouragement in Revelation, right? Conquer, overcome, be a witness. How do you do that? There's only one way. All of the New Testament says the same thing. There's only one way to be an overcomer. By grabbing hold of Christ and enduring the suffering that he went through as well. You suffer as Christ suffered. It's a beautiful thing. In fact, let's look at just a couple more passages real quick. You're going to see a constant theme here. You're going to see a progression. Look at what he says in Romans 5. This is Paul speaking. He says, therefore, therefore, since we've been justified, he's talking about justification, being born again. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Isn't that wonderful? 
Listen to that. We have been justified by faith, therefore we have peace with God. It's all through Jesus Christ. And by the way, through him you also have obtained access by that same faith into grace. And you stand there. You stand there glorify or waiting to the, for the day when you're going to be glorified. You stand in grace in the hope of the glory of God. And then listen to what he says next. It's kind of peculiar. You might think he would say, more than that. And then you hear a new car or something. I mean, what could be better, right? More than that. And then he says, we rejoice in our sufferings. Again, why? Well, because suffering produces something. It produces endurance, steadfastness, constancy. And endurance, by the way, that produces something too. It produces character. And don't you know character? It produces something too. It produces hope. And wouldn't you know that hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now you'll notice, you don't go from suffering to hope. You don't, it's not how it works. Suffering produces endurance, and then endurance produces character, and character produces hope. It's a progression. That's how God does it. How about this one? Romans 8, talking about knowing that we are sons of God. He says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Holy Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. He goes on in verse 16, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Well, that's great. His spirit that resides in us bears witness with our spirit that we belong to him. Isn't that wonderful? And it is. Now, verse 17, And if children, then heirs. It just keeps getting better. We're heirs. And if heirs of God, then fellow heirs with Christ. Well, that's fantastic. The spirit tells us we belong to him. It reminds us that we're heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, but it doesn't stop there. It says something else. It says, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Hmm. Wow. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. Provided. It's a contingency factor. It's saying that you will suffer. If you are a believer in Christ, there will be suffering. Don't worry. He knows about it, and it's good. Let's look at one more. There's so many we could look at. Let's just look at one more here. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 4. This is one of my favorites because listen to what he says here. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking. Very important passage here. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Suffering produces something, doesn't it? Yep. Produces steadfastness. It makes us perfect, complete, lacking nothing. It removes sin also. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. If there's sin in our lives that God wants to remove, he oftentimes will use suffering. When you're going through a season of suffering, you'll notice that sin isn't a big priority to you. Jesus is, because you're clinging to him with your life. That's why he uses suffering. Whoever suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live for the rest of their time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. He goes on in chapter 4 of 1 Peter, verse 12, he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. As something strange were happening, but here he goes again, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering that you may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. We see something here constantly. That suffering, going through trials and tribulation is a good thing because it makes us more like Jesus. In fact, if we're a believer and we're not going through suffering, something is likely coming, and if we never have it, we might wonder if we really belong to him, because it is a badge of honor to suffer like Christ suffered. It doesn't mean we're going to be crucified and nailed to a cross. It means that we 
as Christians are going to go through tough times and it's going to prove our faith, it's going to prove who we belong to and who we don't belong to. And what happens to people who go through trials and it doesn't prove their faith? What happens to those people? Well, let's take a look at one and then we'll end here. Matthew 13, the parable of the sowers. We all know the parable of the sower. There's four examples. The second example is this. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. There's a lot of people who hear the word, they hear the gospel, and they immediately receive it with joy. Yet, I'm sorry, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, when persecution comes, when trials comes, on account of the word, because he's reading the word, claiming the word, claiming the name of Christ, what happens? He immediately falls away. So, the trials, the tribulation, they test our faith, they show who belongs to Christ and who doesn't. And those who belong to Christ, they get sanctified by those trials. So count it all joy, my brothers, when you receive trials of any kind, of various kinds, of all kinds, because you know those trials produce steadfastness, constancy. And you know steadfastness produces complete faith, lacking nothing, being made more like Him. Peace.